conference, it was a uh, it was a conversation. It was a conversation uh, with thirty two people, uh, about twenty four of them. Uh, were teenagers from schools in India, Nigeria, and uh, Gibraltar. Uh, the others were people over uh, 60 years old. And it was about democracy and why democracy is or isn't important to people and what uh, they think democracy could become or actually should become in the future. So uh, people who would uh, join it would be joining to have that conversation. And we'll have another conversation with different people from Nigeria, India, uh, Gibraltar, and a different set of uh, society's elders uh, next week on the 24th. So wow. that's quickly you. what it was. Yeah. How many, hour, how many hours before now is it? <laughs> just to make it easy for me to figure that out. Uh, you mean the time here? Yeah. How it's, many hours? Uh, it's uh, five in the evening, a minute past five p.m. No, but, when, but how many hours ago was the discussion? Oh, the discussion was uh, 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 six hours ago it ended. Oh, okay. Thank you. And we did have at least one person who woke up in the middle of the night from America to take part. Yeah, that would have been five in the morning here. Okay, yeah. now yeah. now I know why I wasn't there. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And but I, next, I, oh, sorry, I was just going to say next year we're going yeah. to try to organize similar conversations in the North America, South America time zone. So it would be Europe and Africa with North and South America. But that's the story for next year. Sounds awesome. Can you repost the link to the event just so that uh, we can, yeah. anybody who's curious can go look at it? I'll certainly do that. Sure. Thank you very much. Stacy. thanks for asking. Sure. Um, hey, everybody. This is the OGM Weekly Call. Open Global Mind is our community. It's Thursday, October 17, 2024. We have been on a bit of a trend here talking about emergent systems of co-regulation or co-governance. Uh, Jose, go ahead. You're muted, however. I wasn't sure if you were going to record. I think I hit the recording. Yes. OK. Oh, All there right. it is. It's on the other side now. The, the yeah, UI yeah. changed. They, they've, they've hidden the UI. But I, I, I did hit the record when Hank was explaining the event. Uh, so I, I was like, I want to I want to capture that already. Uh, so thanks, Jose. Um, so we have been on a bit of a trend talking about uh, emergence as a as a large grab bucket for a series of uh, topics like government, governance, co-regulation, uh, how do we create society together? Uh, Sam kind of sparked us into this and um, he and I had a, a fun conversation yesterday uh, where we were turning over the soil in, in a corner of this that might be a good place for us to start today. Um, so I thought I would sort of revive that, uh, revive that thought for a second and, and see where, where it takes us. But before I do that, I wanted to just ask around and see if there are any reflections on these conversations so far, any uh, things you wish we had done or would do, uh, anything like that. So thoughts on the last couple, uh, couple of these calls. And if there are no comments, we will just proceed. Sounds great. But feel free to feel free to chime in about the about your reflections, and in particular, um, what you wish we would do. I'm I'm finding a a surfeit of manifesti and interesting essays and posts and all that out in the world. There are a lot of people thinking about these kinds of issues in different ways, uh, and it's sort of hard to hard to make your way through the volume of it sometimes, and then. I don't know. And and just this morning, I was seeing that there's also a, a, an excess of AI manifestos about how the, the world is going to change. So that's fun. Uh, too much reading all around. Uh, so the thing that Sam and I were talking about yesterday was, um, I, I think I was decrying how when you get on a platform that's trying to do democracy or do something like that, what you wind up getting is a whole series of disconnected proposals or questions or whatever. And 
effectively, a lot of platforms have some kind of polling interface and a chart that'll show you, you know, like, like Lumio or Polis or whatever, uh, where you can see the results of somebody's opinion on X. We should imprison the homeless, let's say. Um, and almost never, in my experience, never do I see these platforms offer a way to create a systemic solution that ties together a series of actions into a point of view. These things never tie together or bubble up into something that says, oh, if you looked at the world this way, you would do these 12 things, which are already on our big long list, uh, but you would do them for a reason and you would understand that they actually reinforce one another, that they, that they amplify or uh, or help each other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that you might want to um, do them as a package in some way. Uh, and, and in fact, the logic of it might be if you didn't do them as a package, they might individually not succeed or be weaker anyway, because they kind of need each other. Uh, same thing happens in the world of DAOs, uh, in the crypto world, where DAOs are expected to be run by people voting on measures that are proposed uh, and voting with their, with their cryptocurrency. And I just think that a, a large tally, a large sort of leaderboard of things that are, people are voting on is a, not just an impoverished, but perhaps a crippled way of trying to think of how to govern together. Um, I'm just making that assertion. Uh, you all may feel differently. I'm eager to hear, uh, you know, how you feel about this and where it takes you. Sam, if you want to riff on, riff on that sort of starting point, I'd love it. And then we'll uh, see where we go. Sure. Yeah. If, if everybody's okay with that, I'm happy to do it. Yeah. So the, indeed, you know, like I was in the DAO space a little bit for a, for a while there and just so dysfunctional with the proposals, like proposal after proposal, random stuff, people asking for money or changes to things. And what it seems to me is that, so what we, what, what I've designed differently, and I think it's a good solution is that you don't ever have a proposal without posing the problem first. So you create a space for other proposals to sit next to yours. And, um, <clears throat> and so, um, you know, like, and then, um, and then, you know, usually there's like a system for where one wins, but um, in the voting system that we developed, it's, it's that you can see how many of them have passed like quorum and the minimum approval level, and then you can rank them after that. So you can see there might be several of them that would would solve the problem and you know other problems, and um, and they may so there may be a like you said like a set of, of of things that could go together. But I think more important than that, and then then all of that is this process of um, iterative um, development of proposals. So when you have a system that where a bunch of ideas are sitting. And then you have a system where you have um, pros and cons. So like um, I look at a proposal and I say, hmm, I like it. I sort of like it. Here's, you know, I have a system that allows their gauging of resonance. Like it's okay. It's pretty good. I pass it, but I don't love it. And here's, here's why I like it. And here's why I don't like it. And those reasons go into a poll in and of itself. And people can upvote or downvote those reasons and propose their own reasons. And so there's like some sense making apparatus that's developed. And this is like, I think the most important thing is that we have to develop the sense-making apparatus, the ability for us to understand each other's positions and to um, use that understanding to iterate and create better proposals. So now, um, now I, I look at the list and I say, okay, you know, people generally feel that this idea is good, but it's missing this. And this idea is really not great because of this. And hmm, this idea might solve both of these problems. Okay, so I post another proposal and people can react to that and they could say why they like it and why they don't like it, et cetera. So to me, it's like there's a core function that needs to be addressed, which is decision-making in groups, sense-making and collaborative decision-making. And <clears throat> when that core function is, uh, is properly attended to when we when we really figure out how to do that in really large groups millions of people then um and and, and small like a you know it's it's the same process more or less and it's all more or less based on a conversation i mean we're talking animals we're storytelling animals right and so we've got um systems that respond to we we understand 
Um, and, and indeed, I think it's a universal principle, like even computers, when they're trying to figure out what algorithm do you, you know, like, you know, interface, they're like, Hey, do you, do you support this protocol? No, I don't support that one. Okay. How about this one? Yes, I support that one. Okay. Here's a package. Did you get it? Yes, I got it. Okay. You know, it's like, there's a process of, and it's, a, it's, when you look at it from a certain light, it's a communication process. It's like a, a conversational process. And so, <clears throat> um, having a, a system of deliberation of sense-making and decision-making that, um, works within our human frailty, right? Like our human um, predisposed nature that, that work that's that's human oriented, right? Like anybody could understand it, and um, and so once you've kind of got that like primal, I guess you could say that like core function, um, then you can apply that pretty much anywhere. I think that's my thesis anyway. So the idea here is like, you know. Um, posing the problem and maybe you know when you have the problem and you have a bunch of um proposals coming through like a challenge you know you're trying to fix the water problem with the watershed in a rural village in india and there's like you know the water table's running dry and the agriculture is dying and how do we solve this problem you know and there's proposals build a dam swales and catchment ponds whatever um the, you might also have a conversation a side conversation around it within that challenge about like what are the values you know like uh, how how important is that we do it quick how important is that we do it cheaply how important is it that you know um you know whatever and so having the ability to um use a lot of tools to set design constraints and um and criteria for what a good solution looks like and so if that's all sort of baked into the decision making apparatus then I think that is the core of governance. That's the core of decision making in groups. Yeah, that's that's how I see it. Thanks, Sam. This, this apparently makes Stacy very happy. Uh, very happy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Love love that. And also, uh, when Sam and I were talking, uh, Jose, I explained to him about our protocols and how each our protocol needs to fit under a need, and how the needs then collect up similar but different responses or protocols to the same exact setting and how that's helpful. Um, but go ahead and uh, you'll have to unmute. There you go. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I was seeing the similarities in, in the, what Sam was describing, but I, my question was going to be a little bit different. Um, I think in abstract um, making decisions, people aren't good at. In other words, like, well, there's people, we need water, This the answer is, right? Um, why are we making a decision? Why don't we run experiments? What are the things that we can do to, to move back from predicting and then controlling whatever it is that we predicted? And then now I commit, you know, I voted for it. I might as well stick with it. It's not working, but I, I really want to stick with it because that's what I voted for um, or, or that's what we started. I wonder if part of what we need to stop doing as a society is um, going the whole hog on these huge ideas, making these big decisions of going left or right in whatever the context is, um, or even in small organizations where we don't think of it as an an ongoing experiment that we can adjust from, but these um, large scale decisions, which leads me to, do we need to make decisions at all? Do we simply experiment with things as a new mode of operating our society? What's the thing that we can experiment with? Let's try it. What gets proven is what we do. What doesn't work, doesn't work, and we don't have to make a decision. We just we just ex run through a series of experiments uh, as much as we can. So that's just the idea. Um, love that, Jose. Thank you. Uh, Sam, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I love this idea of kind of being more iterative. And <clears throat> um, so one of the ways that this could be addressed is that, and how we're addressing it, is that the voting is fluid. So um, if there's a time frame or if there's a way like 
um, there's sort of two ways an idea could pass in our system, which is like um, that uh, once an idea, once a proposal passes both quorum and approval, like enough people like it and the community decides what enough is and um, enough people have looked at it and voted on it and enough of those people like it. And, um, and then a time period goes on for people to decide, you know, if they change their mind or if they want to try something else or whatever. But then once it passes and then it's like, you know, the community has to decide, you know, and they've decided they want to do, do this thing. I mean, if, if you're running experiments, you sort of have to decide, you have to decide what experiments you want to run and what are the criteria for a successful experiment and what are the criteria for an unsuccessful one? Do you stop the experiment? What are those are all, those are all decisions that have to be made, you know? And so the idea here is that even after a decision is made, the voting stays open. So there's a snapshot taken of that, the moment that the the time ran out and we said, okay, we're going to decide by the end of the year. And then, okay, the time ran or, you know, whatever it is. And so that's the decision. You can see how strongly people felt about the ver the various components, the reasons for the, 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 what we call the granular proposal system. So the proposal itself is more like a Twitter post. And then there's all these sub agreements, like where would we build the dam? How much would we spend on it? Who would build it? you know, what color would you be, you know, all those things. Like, so there's a snapshot of all those sort of decisions that were made crowdsourced. Um, and then, but then the main topic itself continues to be voted on. And so as more information comes in, we're like, wait a minute, you know, this is going to cause problems here. We're going to stop the fish and it's going to kill the birds and, you know, whatever. And people are like, oh, I don't like this idea anymore. I don't like this idea anymore. Then you press a button, you say, call for a revote. And so the, um, <clears throat> the ability uh, so then, should we call for a revote? Is a poll. <laughs> so the community says, should we call for a revote? And everyone says yes or no. And if they say yes, okay, time for a revote. Now the now the 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 the, the snapshot is stored, and you've got a fresh um, decision to make, and a, perhaps a period of time to make that decision, or or it just opens it up. And and so now the idea that people went with is down regulated. Oh, we're not doing that anymore. Okay. What are we doing? Any other ideas? Maybe there's no good ideas anymore. So nothing is done. Um, waiting for a good idea to come through. And so indeed, like, so it's this process of a little bit of fluidity, a little bit of like <laughs> um, that the conversation is open and it's it, it remains open. And there's a risk that, um, you know, that nothing will get done. But I think um, that's a risk that we're willing to take. You know, like my mom used to always say, Everybody should just stop, stop doing it, everything. They're doing too many things. Like, stop, just stop going to work, everybody. <laughs> so, but, um, but, but applied to the um, endeavors that we do as, as group decision-making, maybe less things should be built. I don't know. Who knows? I like that. <clears throat> maybe also there should be a rhythm to decision-making where there's a push every now and then, uh, and then we, we sort of dwell and experiment in between or something like that. Um, you were reminding me of a story I heard long ago about uh, Japanese consensus culture in business and, 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 and government um, and the, the way that Japanese business proposals circulate inside a company is that there will be a big proposal that will be printed out uh, or written up and then it gets passed around and you can tell how old the proposal is by how thumbed up it is. So the actual physical wear of the document is an indicator of man, this thing's been circulating for a long, long time and we still haven't sort of sorted it out. And then as each participant agrees to it, they take their chop, basically their seal, and they apply their seal to the document. And the degree to which their seal differs from the vertical is the degree to which they disagree with the proposal. But they're signing on. So you're, and, and I, I'm reconstituting this. I'm clearly not Japanese and haven't lived in this culture, but my understanding of it is you could you could you could sign your chop like 90 degrees off which means i'm really not crazy about this but i'm signing on and once everybody's sort of said yes and the thing goes the reason that japanese companies can move very quickly is that they have actually had the conversations and done the work that we tend to postpone or ignore or even skip past we don't let people talk about proposals like that so uh so in des in developing software what is the equivalent of the well-thumbed proposal and what is the equivalent of the chop that's off center as opposed to the vote that says I'm in or I'm out or, or, or whatever. How do we get some subtleties of behavior? This reminds me also of Tom Munnicky, one of the developers of Global Vista, which is the open source software that runs the VA system still barely 
despite lots of attempts to take it take it down. And he used to say that nurses are the people who know the most about a patient. They see them all the time. They can tell if your skin is slightly more ashen than last time they saw you. All subtleties that the system will not capture easily. Uh, the the kinds of things that are that are in a nurse's understanding of a patient don't make it into the system at all. Uh, sorry for the long digression. Uh, we're off to Gil, who is uh, masked behind his avatar, but also I know has a lot of experience with Fernando Flores and speech act theory and communities making commitments explicitly through messaging, but I don't know that that's where you're going to go, Gil. And 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 working with uh, organizations of different types and different sizes. I, 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 I've come in a little late and um, I'm curious. Um, oh, you're at SB, aren't you? I am, I'm Sustainable Brands in San Diego. Awesome. Um, we have breakfast, uh, and so I'm just going to sit here and have breakfast with you guys. Thank you. Um, um, I'm, I'm what, so I, I like what Jose said about not making decisions, because there's a case to be made that we never make decisions anyway. But uh, that's a, that's maybe a story for another time. Yes, the uh, this is the Sustainable Development Goals for the United Nations, hundred and what ninety eight countries who've signed on to 17 commitments from the planet. Kind of an amazing thing. Uh, speaking of decisions. So <clears throat> I guess I'm a little puzzled about what context or contexts are we talking about? What types of what types of collections of humans are we talking about? What size of aggregations of humans are we talking about? Because I've spent the last few days uh, with about 900 people, many of whom from companies. Some of these are companies of 10 and 20 and 50 people, and some of these are companies of 50 and 100,000 and 300,000 people. And so the process would seem to be really different in different settings, all, also with different time frames of consideration. Some things have to be figured out quickly. Some things don't. Uh, the Japanese process is really intriguing to me, Jerry, and I'd love to know more about it. And I wonder how they valve for urgency uh, in that system, because um, there's something lovely about the natural rhythm of people finding enough coherence to move forward and then have a high degree of alignment around that. Uh, but sometimes you don't have time for that. And it seems, you know, and I don't know if this is a necessity, but it seems that in the kind of organizational cultures we mostly have on the planet today, um, there is an there, there there's a a, a regulated cadence uh, and process and um, um, and you know I'm here with people talking a lot about budget cycles decisions that need to be made in the next one to three months that will govern things that are going to happen for the next year um, makes it challenging to revisit things that take you know there's a lot of work to mobilize alignment and to mobilize capital and to deploy systems that are kind of, you know, kind of committed once they're committed. So the fluidity that we're imagining here, which, which while it's lovely, it's challenging to see how that matches with the processes of, you know, you're building an airport. Um, there's, uh, if you're going to do it well, there's got to be a lot of time at the front end, kind of like that Japanese process, right? But at some point, things are deployed and kind of have to go that way unless there's something significant that says, we need to break the decision and go somewhere else. So I'm in uh, I, I, lots of interesting questions that arise out of listening to you all here. Um, and I guess the challenge that I would raise for us is, <clears throat> is to imagine uh, us as a wonderful group of people thinking about interesting things, to imagine yourself as a responsible person in a large organization having to deploy people and capital around shared commitments. And how does it work there? I think those are different, but maybe not. I'm reasonably sure they're not doing what we're doing uh, here. But but but, but could they? Would yeah. we want? Would we want them to? Would you want an airline to run this way? Would you want a hospital to run this way? Uh, you know, put put you know put you know. Would you want a city government to run this way? Put you know, fill in the blank of various sorts. But I think this is a a worthwhile stress test to our discussions here. Is like you know, wonderfully interesting ideas. How would it work in this setting? Would it succeed in this setting? What are you know, we'll learn something from that about what you know what what I think was Sam talking about about criteria and constraints, which are going to be different in different realms. So that dimension. I'm going to go back on mute and avatar and eat some food. Thanks. Um, I wish more organizations had 
the slack to have more conversations uh, that run relatively deep. And I, the feeling I have is that most of those people are busy running from meeting to meeting or deadline to deadline or KPI to KPI. So uh, that would be useful. Uh, Mark, please. Um, Gil said pretty much exactly what I was going to say. Um, I was in a parking lot with um, Stuart Brand and I was asking him maybe 20 years ago or more about the consensus process and, you know, how, you know, decisions are made equitably. And he comes from a military background. He basically says, if you want to build a dam, you got to have a general. You got to have somebody who's making the decisions and responsibility for the decisions and the buck stops here. Um, and it made me think. It's like, huh, all right. Yeah, there are different timescales. Decisions need to be made now. FEMA emergency. We need mesh networks in North Carolina immediately. Um, okay, make it happen. Um, no no discussion, no argument. Do it now. Um, huh, okay. Doesn't sound very fluid to me. Um, the stuff that I study with Terry Deacon is called emergent dynamics. How the dynamics emerge from um, homeodynamics or basic entropy. Um, things fall apart to things that don't fall apart which are basically amplification structures, which are um, self-organizing systems. And when you have only amplification, things run away. Things go into positive feedback um, and you basically end up eating all the resources and things fall apart again. Entropy wins. And so the third emergence is the beginning of self and of regulation and communication um and that's organic systems people um bacteria um viruses even um where to perdure to persist there needs to be regulation there needs to be at least two self-organizing systems that basically create the constraints for each other in kind of an interlocking um knot so that they both persist and higher level regulation happens above that. And that's a very complex thing to study. And, you know, certainly there's the consensus process, which worked incredibly well during the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant um, Abalone Alliance um, grouping that lasted for years. Um, I'm working with a group called Maker Farm in Alameda. Um, they have their own process of... Um, you know, certainly things like, uh, what is it? Um, uh, they've been around for a very long time. Uh, uh, other maker groups. Um, I'm thinking of one in San Francisco, which is... Out of fruit? No, no, no. no. It's um, it's the hacker space, um, mostly for tech. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll think of it. Um, I'm forgetting as well. But yeah. Um, so there's many different um scales and, and certainly time and you know i've been in so many different organizations from pg e to um uh you know wells fargo to um uh the internet archive either as a consultant or employee and um you know working for a lesbian sperm bank there's different ways that people have constraints on what they can do especially as lower participants, but lower participants have power. Lower participants, the people who are actually, you know, got their fingers on the keyboard, who are doing the data entry, who are who are basically talking to the customers coming in, they run the organization in a different way that the CEO does. Um, it's, it's all participants at all levels um, working together and a lot of this happens without explicit guidance. There's a lot of implicit knowledge that people bring to their situation. And a lot of that doesn't get codified, can't get codified. We don't have the ability to um, communicate everything that we actually do and know. Um, 
uh, who is it? Um, Michael Polyani writes about implicit knowing and how all knowing happens by a person. It doesn't happen by a book. It doesn't happen by an AI. Anything that happens has to go through a brain and into the fingers or into the, you know, the body, um, out of the mouth. Um, I, I highly mistrust the notion of an external system because people actually have to pay attention to that system. People have to use it. They have to, um, you know, interact with it. They have to ha have it as an interface between one person and another. And, you know, we do that without systems. We just do that like we're doing right here. We're, we're using a system that uh, is called Zoom, I guess. And, um, you know, we could do this without Zoom. We could do this on telephones. We could do this meeting in person. And, uh, you know, I don't think that I look for Zoom and, you know, the protocols that we have for raising our hands or for being quiet and listening as governance. But maybe it is. Um, thank you for listening. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Alistair. Um, yeah, so I know that uh, Sam mentioned human frailties, and uh, I was wondering what about, uh, uh, well, two things. One, if what if there's someone who's not there to uh, come for a decision, help come for a decision, but trying to disrupt the whole process? And secondly, what if, uh, what if I am trying to come for a decision, but I just happen to have more influence, more money, more guns than everyone else? I'm going to get uh, more say in the decision. How do you deal with that? These are the big questions. Uh, these are the huge questions. Uh, Sam, you looked like you wanted to jump in and try to answer them. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to address, because these are great. I really appreciate everybody's. Oh, does Gil, is Gil, he still has his hand. Okay. He's got his hand um, up. He'll be back in a second. Okay. Um, so I'll just sort of address them in reverse order as best I can. So the first one has to do with um, the problem of someone who's not there to find solutions, but there to just be a, be a, you know, disrupt things. And so you have to account for that. You know, I mean, there's some estimate that some people with uh, people with, um, you know, dark triad personality disorders, you know, are, re represent like 1% of the population, like there's a lot of them. And so you have to have a system that distributes the thinking and the decision making, and in order to, you know, bypass this issue of the the corrupting power of influence of leadership of et cetera. So that's that's where um, that's where um, a a crowdsourcing I think is actually the solution um, rather than a problem. So the more broadly you can distribute the the power, the less likely um, you know um, individual corrupted individuals or problematic individuals the less power they will have because. Yeah. So, um, and to go a little further, um, and also like extreme ideas will tend to dissipate when you, all the people who are, um, <clears throat> at stake in a decision, when, if they're, if they're all empowered to contribute to the process, you're less likely to have an imbalanced perspective. So you're, you're more likely to have all of the stakeholder perspectives, all of the, the concepts and concerns and everything addressed and, um, and for them to be represented. So as long as the system can accommodate that, you know, single choice voting doesn't accommodate that. Um, and so then, then also, you know, people with more power and more, you know, guns and all that kind of stuff, like that's, that's not, um, a governance process. That's somebody, you know, corrupting, a governance process. And so, you know, and, and that's exactly what, you know, the founding fathers were trying to solve when they wrote the constitution. And that's in fact been the, the, the problem that we've been trying to solve with governance ever since, which is like, how do we prevent the um, concentration of power into the hands of fewer and fewer people um, who are sort of trying to <clears throat> Um, meet their own interests there. And so the answer is the distribution. And so we, we've, we've with our dem democratic system, as we've managed to distribute the power to representatives who um, are able to 
you know, they have terms and they can be voted out and et cetera. But the next logical extension of that is why don't we just distribute it to everybody and those who have good ideas that people resonate with, they are empowered as long as they keep having good ideas. As soon as they start having dumb ideas and they don't resonate with people, we disempower them quietly, gently. We don't throw them out. We just click, turn the vote. Oh, I think this guy has a better idea. Should... Okay, that's the concept of liquid democracy. And so and so that that's really how that works is, you know, that's the whole point of that. Um, and also, that's also the, with the liquid uh, democracy, that's the advantage, as Mark was talking about, with people who have who are on the ground who are trying to who have implicit knowledge, you know, they're in a system like this, you know, a nurse comes in and says, hey, you know, we are not, um, you know, doing a good job of doing, you know, skin exams or, or notifying people when there's, you know, um, objective changes to the this and that, you know, like we need to be able to do that and mark that. And so a system where the power is distributed and where anybody can propose ideas um, is more likely to be responsive <coughs> and <clears throat> find solutions to the the implicit problems and, and address and um, make use of the implicit knowledge that people have. So that's part of the problem. We have expertise, but the way we do expertise now is we appoint a leader. We appoint, you know, the head of the NIH or whatever. And here's one person and they're a political appointee. No one voted them in and they have their agenda that they have. They have a political agenda. What if we took that position and crowdsourced it to everybody with a master's degree or higher in public health? What would happen then? Well, they would propose ideas. They would draw from different knowledge. And because the, 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 the crowdsourcing of the wisdom is <clears throat> spread to a wide variety of experts, then, <clears throat> you know, if the system works well, then you have the best ideas rising to the top, the things that resonate with the most people. So that's that's kind of that, how, how I see that that problem being solved. Um, this idea of when someone needs to take responsibility for a project, like a general, it's certainly possible to do what we call in liquid democracy, elect somebody, which is somebody, you choose somebody to have a sustained focus. So there are lots of, it's like hiring somebody. It's, it, you, you, you accept volunteers, you hire somebody, they're called, you elect them. Maybe it comes with payment, whatever it is, you can make those decisions. But there are times when you need someone to have sustained focus on a specific topic and to take responsibility. And so that's like, yeah, like a temporary hierarchy or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's certainly possible. And, you know, it's under the purview of a group to, to empower people. So um, that, um, you know, so it, it, it's not that like every single way of managing every problem has to be done by every single person. The, there can be some flexibility there in how this is deployed. And I think that's the solution is that we need to figure out how to deploy this in a way that can address the actual scenarios that we're actually facing. And that goes to um, the other statement, which is like the size of the community, um, what tools, you know, um, timeframes, how can those be managed? Um, <clears throat> you know, and also in setting X, setting Y, setting Z, how, like how can a, a process be so flexible to be, accommodate various sizes? Um, various situations, various time frames, but indeed it can. And um, I wrote a, I uh, developed a voting system called the Arch Method, and it's it's really about um, addressing time frames and having a community be able to have a set of variables. Like, okay, this is a, um, a default decision, so it means that we're not going to make any decision until you know a solution passes um, quorum and. Um, you know, so, and our quorum is like, say it's a small group. So we're going to say 100% of the people have to vote on it before we'll make any decision. And, you know, um, and 80% of them have to approve it. You know, in a small group, you can come up with that. But in a huge group, like a country, you couldn't do that. You know, maybe even 1% of the people are voting. So you, you can set those parameters for the group about how many people need to vote, what percentage of people need to vote, what percentage of people need to approve. And and then, um, then the time frame. Once once something has passed or or uh, <clears throat> approval, the um, how long do we have to come up with a better solution or change our minds or whatever before we say, okay, this is our this is our official position. Um, and indeed, so um, and if, you know, but but if it was like a a more like a bylaws decision or a financial decision, you might need a higher percentage of quorum, a higher percentage of approval. 
at a longer time frame. So the community can kind of set those and can tweak those. Those are all parameters that are readily changeable in the vote in this voting method. So um and then um and you can have multiple, you can have like a bylaws voting set. You know, you can have a financial voting set, you can have a default voting set, etc. So um and then indeed we would just have to apply it to setting X, setting Y, setting Z. How does it work in a hospital? How does it work in a air, airport, building the airport? How does it work running the airport? How does it, you know, et cetera? And so um yeah, those are my answers for those things. Um substantial answers they are thanks sam um uh i want to go back to one thing uh alistair asked which was about when some players have more power or money or access and it's a question i've had just about systems design is that how can you sort of hobble people who have unusual weight in a situation can their power be manifest as big gloves that don't let them like be as dexterous can they can can their extra access be a handicap and turned against them a bit so that they're so that it's weakened a bit or made more manifest or something and and i i like systems that try to um have self-governing like a governor mechanism on a steam engine right the little balls go out the steam gets let out and the the, gov the engine sort of stays more steady how do you do that in, in, in human systems design i'm really curious about that um gil please you've been very patient and hopefully you're still uh by your phone. Command Gil. Uh, Gil, whenever you come back to your phone, we'll uh, take you in. Instead, let's go to Hank. Yeah, OK. Uh... Uh, I'm really interested in these types of processes uh, and especially in how they work in practice. Uh, I've had many years uh, working mostly face to face with uh, with reasonably large groups trying to get uh, a collaborative decision making uh, done where in the beginning, what you need to do is clarify uh, the problem or the problem behind the problem uh, before you start looking for solutions. And that takes a long time. So I think this type of process that uh, uh, we are discussing and that uh, uh, Sam is uh, telling us about is really useful. But even with smaller groups face-to-face, -face, it's really important to get the most important stakeholders together in the room whether it's a physical room or a uh, an online process room. And sometimes you might not know who the really important stakeholders are. And sometimes they might not know that they're very important in your process, or they might not even know about your process, or they might not trust your process. Uh, a lot of the projects I've worked on are uh, in consortia, which were government led or government set up. And there's a huge uh, amount of distrust, certainly in uh, European countries, distrust of people and their governments. So what do you do to get the right people in the right problem behind the problem that you're trying to solve? And I don't have good answers to that. I can tell you lots of things that don't work in a face-to-face -face situation. And I can only imagine how they could be exasperated in a larger online process. But there's one thing that came up early in the discussion, which I really liked. Uh, and I have the same set of questions about that uh, when, Sam, you were talking about uh, re-voting when a process has already been started, and for example, it's a large infrastructure process, uh, if the wrong people were in the room or a better answer emerged than was originally decided upon, it's a terrific idea to re-vote and try to push the process in another way. But in my experience, mostly European, the media has a field day with that and uh, knocks all the trust that citizens have had in government participative processes, uh, it cuts them to shreds. So 
those are comments which I hope you can see as questions, and perhaps there are some answers, or groups like this can work out some answers. Thank you. Um, thanks, Hank. Uh, we sort of have um, an, uh, an informal collection of who knows a lot of it and has done a lot about this. I would love to improve that collection. And it looks like Gil is back at his phone. Uh, so Gil, the floor is yours. You have to find the mute button first. There we go. I didn't realize I had my camera still on. Hi. Um, uh, so I've missed most of the last 15 minutes since I was talking to people here, but I was intrigued by what Mark was saying back a while ago, if I can remember back to what it was. Um, <clears throat> The Terry Deacon work is really important. Uh, when Mark was talking about regulation, uh, I was thinking about Maturana's turn of coupling, which I think has a different flavor to it uh, than regulation. Maturana talks about structural coupling, about how in, in, in the realm of how organisms, entities, molecules, and so forth dance together. Uh, so it's not a control um, 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 metaphor. It's something. It's a something else metaphor, and it's worthy of some deep investigation. Um, I've spent a bunch of time here at this conference with a guy named Neil Thies, T-H-E-I-S-E. -E. He's a medical doctor uh, and a Zen Buddhist and one of the pioneers of stem cell research. And he's just come out with a book on complexity, complex adaptive systems. And he's been talking about a lot about that here. I'm, I'm sure somebody could find the title of it. Uh, we just did a Living Between Worlds with him yesterday and seemed to have lost the recording. So we're trying to find that. No. Um, yeah. Yeah, speaking of emergence, <laughs> but really profound and fascinating stuff about the dynamics of complex adaptive systems of everything from liver tissue to ant colonies to human societies. Um, and um, Neil offered four principles. Um, and I remember that. Um, no, I can't. I'll have to go, I'll have to post that to post later. Maybe somebody can find it on a quick search. One has to do with large numbers. Um, um, you know, so an ant colony of 25 ants will produce different emergent properties than an ant colony of 25,000 or 250,000 ants. Um, 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 he talked about local sensing challenging, the, basically asserting that there is no global sensing. It's all local sensing, even in planetary enterprises and large corporations. Uh, even a you know, CEO of a large corporation actually only has direct contact with a limited number of people. He, you know, she has awareness or relationship with the entire company, but it's all local sensing of global of globally emerging phenomena. It's number two, maybe number three, and there are a couple of others really fascinating and very relevant to the discussion that we're having here and a very different frame than what we have been calling governance, regulation, and other terms that convey an already framed perspective on what we're talking about. So, you know, and we talked about this a little bit last week, Jerry, about challenging the language that we can use to, to hold the conversation, which kind of predetermines uh, and perhaps limits our creativity. And you know, we'll, we'll talk about that more next week, and us if we have that queued up. Cool. Yeah, no. thanks, Gil, and thanks for making it back to your phone. That was good. Yeah, and, and yeah, <clears throat> our own, our own metaphor is a most remarkable and deeply important book. Thank you, Mark, for posting that. Cool, uh, Mark, please. Gil, do you want to lower your hand, or are you kind of getting back in the queue? That's okay. I can lower his hand. Uh, as a UX developer, yeah, um, I pay attention to um, a lot of um, you know magazines and articles about user experience design, UI design, software design. The globally voted on biggest problem is buy-in from stakeholders. It's great to create. Um, software that works for as many people as possible, that works for people with different, you know, cognitive disabilities or um, blind people or people who um, are deaf. But buy-in from stakeholders, next to impossible. Um, I'm looking at 
I'm trying to look at this as a whole system and ideas are great. Knowing what the problem is, is great. What problem are we trying to solve? Do we have the correct problem that we're trying to solve? Is there a larger um, set of constraints that this problem fits inside of that we need to address as part of the problem? What I'm not hearing talked about is operations. Okay, once we make a decision, we're going to do X. Somebody has to implement that. Somebody has to go and say, okay, um, the UX team is going to do this. The database team is going to do that. Um, uh, you know, we're going to basically get security involved to make sure that we're not, you know, exposing our users to, um, you know, what's just happened many times over and over and again, over and again, the user database gets hacked. Um, operations are difficult and operations matter. They matter immensely. You can have all the good ideas in the world. And if you're giving them the PG&E, well, maybe we're going to, have uh, the gas mains blow up and kill people in Brisbane. Um, now, should PG&E be thrown out the window because it's killed people? Um, some people, you know, it went bankrupt, um, but it's still there. And is it doing good by delivering energy to people? Um, you know, I was talking with um, my friend Sam Webster in a class on transformative ritual design at the Berkeley Olympic last night. He said, yeah, it's killed people. PG&E should be disbanded. Well, that's billions and billions of infrastructure. How do you make that swerve to say, okay, PG&E is no longer an entity. Now it's going to be a different entity and that entity is not going to kill people. Well, I can't make that guarantee. I don't know what to do with a swerve in a huge system that millions of people depend on for their daily gas, electricity. Um, mm, at least, you know, from my knowledge of PG&E, there's no longer people in gas delivery who are drunk under their desks as they were in the eighties that, um, you know, they were just coasting until retirement. Um, you know, things change, um, cultures change, but cultures don't change quickly. Culture is incredibly resilient to um, rapid change. Now, incremental change, as Sam is proposing, I'm all for that. That's incredible. Let's, let's, let's try everything that can work, but don't expect it to be a, a radical change. Expect it to be slow, lasting long after our lifetimes um and certainly as a whole systems thinker boy oh boy i'm not hearing anything about operations about the people who are actually going to implement the ideas that are chosen and if they don't agree they don't get implemented um very well um making sure that people who are the quote-unquote lower participants who actually have the pedal to the metal who are driving the trucks, who are basically installing the power lines and checking the gas um, leaks in uh, you know, the underground pipelines. Uh-uh. Ensuring their participation, um, that doesn't happen by voting. That happens by human to human. Hey, did you do the job? Did When you check this off the checklist, did it actually happen? How that happens... I don't have a voting solution for that. I don't have a regulatory solution to that, except, you know, who's watching the watchers? Just something, just custodies, custodies. Um, that takes an integrated, cooperative mistrust. Yeah, did you do the job? Hell, no, you didn't do the job. What are we going to do? Are we going to vote on what we're going to do with the person who doesn't do the job? Um, you know, I, I think there's so much more levels of complexity when it comes to actually getting things done. Last thing I'm going to say, I was at the Caper Center, um, and they had a Latin uh, innovation and investment um, party uh, for second to the last day of uh, Mexican-American um, month which is funny because it 
goes from the 15th to the 17th. It's not the first to the first. Um, and um, uh, thank goodness for Mitch Caper and, and what he's doing. Um, but it was interesting that you know, of all the VCs, 1.2% are Latin, according to you know, the research. Um, and that's you know, much less than is um, represented in our population. Um, Ihole, let's go um, uh, Latin Americans, but um, uh, and let's go for people who are hoping to increase the participation of all in you know the people who are making some things happen. You know, people who are able to push big pieces of capital around to help people who do have ideas, people who do have the operational structures or want to build the operational structures to actually get stuff done um go sam um thank you for for your um uh provocations here um and um thank you for listening to my pushback appreciate it thanks mark uh, go ahead sam great so i want to uh, address all of these things so the latest the, starting with the last one mark um the idea here is um a couple things one is how do does operations move forward? So when you have a system that is has broadly um, empowered, you know, the, the concept of everybody who um, who is going to be affected by a decision must contribute, has the power to contribute should they want to. Um, so and so when you have people who are there turning the screws and they're actually part of the process and they can see that there's a sense making process. So there's like, what about this? Okay, not no because of this reason and that reason. And the community, you see how the community resonates with each each reason for or against a proposal, for example. And so there's this <clears throat> documentable, um, participatory sense making process. And and so and there and the, the the person who turns the screws is part of that. And so that's how you get the buy in. And of course, um, you know, the, always the question is, you know, you have Congress and they're making decisions, and then somebody has to actually do it. And, you know, of course, that's a whole other, that's a there's there's you know ways to do that people's salaries and managers and all that kind of stuff. And that and that has to be accounted for. But um, but when there's a participatory process, you know, I think we're going to find that it, people are much more likely to um, <clears throat> be willing to turn the screws on the thing. Right. Um, so. And um, so there's another concept here, which is that how do I love this question? How do we get the important stakeholders um, into a room? So there's no such thing as a politician or a delegate in liquid democracy, but there are or there are a representative. Nobody's representing anybody. People are voting the way they believe or proposing and making um, proposals and voting on things. And some people are going to really encapsulate the and really understand the a certain perspective on a certain proposal or a certain challenge or something, and they're going to be able to. Um, describe it really well. And a lot of people are going to resonate with them. And they say, that guy says this better than I could, you know? And um, I think he knows a lot more about this situation than I do. I'm going to delegate to him because I don't want to think about it. And so what will happen is that as there are different perspectives in the community, people will rise as they're, they get more and more delegations. And so, um, and they'll be, they will sort of represent the, the different dialectical positions, the thesis is the thesi and the anti-thesi and et cetera. And so once there's a small number of these people and we don't have a consensus, you put these people into a room on a YouTube video or with an actual mediation process, a process where you're saying, look, you guys have good ideas. Um, this is, we're looking for the synthesis. We're looking for the, you, you know, the thing that satisfies both, you know, the, 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 the cylinder that's a, a circle on one side and a square on the other, but let's, let's understand the cylinder. And so, um, and so that's, the, that's a sense-making process that people do mediation and conflict resolution and um, higher order thinking. Um, but it can be done um, <clears throat> in this way, in a liquid form where, you know, with any given challenge, um, there will pe be people who really represent the different positions and having them sort of have a, a mediated discussion to, to look for the synthesis. So that's the idea of getting the stakeholders. You know, you're in a hospital and, you know, the nurses have one position and, you know, nobody's listening to the nurses now, but in a system where there's, a, there's, a, there's an open forum for all of the ideas to emerge and the cream to rise to the top, 
the voice, the, the nurses who represent like half of the people in the freaking hospital, you know, um, now have a significant position, you know, and so and they have a significant platform. And that's kind of what we're looking for. Um, but there is also this issue of expertise. And so, um, you know, the question was, um, is there a better alternative measure of understanding than an advanced degree? So sometimes yes, and sometimes no. So in a process, um, you, you know, where you can filter the proposals and the comments based on expertise. So you have um, expertise tags is what we're calling them. So people with um, degrees and they can get those vetted by a third party. So they get special badges and then you can filter by them. So, hey, anybody with a master's degree in public health, I, I want to hear what they have to say. Hmm. Okay. Or what we call we're the, the stable bodies of experts. So everybody in the United States with a public health master's degree or higher is now part of a body called the public health um, body of experts. And so they are as a group voting on the same things that everybody else is, you know, COVID or, you know, whatever it is and, uh, or kids with autism or whatever. And so now they're now, instead of having one expert who's really focused on their thing, maybe they're come from the pharmaceutical industry or whatever it is. Now you have a, a crowdsourced decision-making apparatus around <clears throat> Um, the challenges, right? How are we going to handle COVID? How are we going to deal with the, you know, fact that, um, you know, 22% of uh, some jurisdictions all have autism, kids, you know, boys and stuff like that. So, um, and so um, that's the, that's the, um, the system that, um, and, and so each person on the network can delegate to the masters, you know, delegate to this body, Right, say I don't really know about public health, but I know this group of people is going to make good decisions. I'm going to delegate to them, and you know because they're 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 a um, distributed network of experts. You're going to have a wide range of opinions, not just the pharmaceutical industry or whatever it is. And so um, and so you can you can delegate to this body, and so whatever however whatever position they hold on topic X, topic Y, topic Z. If you don't like it, you just change it. You tweak it. You say, you know what? I think I know better on this, you know, whatever. I'm a conspiracy theorist. And I think, you know, the pharmaceutical industries are destroying the world and I'm just going to vote no on this and that. You you can do that. And you can propose things that are that way. And maybe you know something and maybe your proposal will resonate with a group of people. And you might find yourself in a room with, um, you know, a master's of public health and having a discussion. And, you know, maybe you're going to get destroyed or maybe you're going to have a good point. And it's up to the people to listen to that and say, hmm, you know what? I think the public health guy has got a better perspective. Like, I'm just going to switch back over to them or vice versa or whatever it is. And so it's that kind of a process where you you um, <clears throat> you enable expertise, right? But you also open the floor <clears throat> to people who have expertise. And, you know, sometimes the, the, the person who um, is going to have a really good position on the public health thing is not a, a doctor. Maybe it's an engineer, you know? And so um, you want to be able to, uh, allow the best ideas to bubble up from wherever they are within the community. So that's my answers to that. Um, stakeholders, um, a, a better alternate measure of understanding. It's called a trust network. You want people who are not just experts, but who also resonate with your values. And, you know, um, you, 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 that you want people who know the material, but also who care about the same things you do, right? Um, and then, um, so in this idea of, the media, when the media has a field day with changes in collaborative decision making. Well, so the idea here with a process that documents why people made the decisions, right? Because you're voting, upvoting the reasons for or against a certain decision. The media, you just say, look, here's the decisions. We, we made them. Here's exactly why. People didn't want this. People wanted that. This proposal passed. And then we found out that this wasn't happening. We switched it. Now we're not doing this proposal anymore. Now we're doing this one. You know, that's what happened. Anybody can look. Here's the link. Click. Um, what's the media going to say about that? You know, so um, yeah, that's my answers. Um, Sam, you're keeping great notes. Uh, thank you for all that. I I'm I'm just realizing I'm I've just become aware of our implicit optimism to be holding this particular conversation three weeks from an election where half of the potential voters appear to be backing a man who thinks that we should kick every everybody out of the co country who's like marginal and that we should impose 100% tariffs on everything and start a tariff war around the world and many other unstable things uh, and has enormous following of people who are really hard to pry from thinking that he is God's own representative on the planet about to make things right. And I love our optimism here. And I'm like, 
ah shit the world is the world is really 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 messy um so so thank you and 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 i appreciate that we're all here trying to figure out how to make this rational or workable or representative or all of the above and uh, he's the, he's the winner in the system we have let's keep that in mind ah ah it's, it's crazy <laughs> it's crazy making uh doug please You took down your hand, but you didn't do the unmute thing. There we go. There we go. Um, yeah. So I want to uh, bring the living part of things to the table. And um, I want to bring the living part of things to the table. Uh, because I think... Um, Everything that's been bounced around um, is of the mental body. And in living things, there's the physical body, and there's the emotional body, and there's the energetic body, and there is the spiritual body. And each one of those energetic dimensions Each one of those namings are evocative of dynamic flows that are constantly in flux and change every instant, from instant to instant, never repeating. And that's the reality, that's the natural world we live in. Pretty much everything in the mental body that was shared relative to that larger, all-inclusive view and recognition of the reality we exist in is very, very primitive and mechanical and, and, and industrial. Even the construct of a system defined through a lens of with boundaries and with parameters and with definitions and with rules and with practices and all of the rest in, in you know, a Stafford beer context, right, um, is an imposition on something that's constantly moving it's putting a nail through a ball of mercury. And as fast as you hit it, the mercury is moving. Now, also rooted in the Stafford Beer's construct of requisite variety and all the rest is the idea that over time, the bureaucracy's sole priority becomes its own self-perpetuation, meaning the imposition of order and structure and framework and all of that on reality to quote, stabilize it becomes its own perpetual motion machine divorced from the needs of the underlying constituencies that comprise the system. And so you end up with a tension where the variability of incoming of new hits a system that's been hardened up and it destabilizes it. And instead of the system shifting and changing immediately to respond to that destabilizing impact, it doubles down. And the doubling down results in more imbalance, more disruption, and that's where we are. So um, I offer you, um, an alternative orientation that is rooted in returning to a connection orientation in alignment with the reality we live in, the natural world and, and, and infinite variability and flows and dynamics of constant change. Um, and folks that are working in the meta to that of 
um, orientational dimensions or perspectives on how to relate to that differently. So there's a woman um, who created an initiative called Winfinity. Winfinity's um, it is a practice for cultivating collective choice. Not decision, not agreements, not governance. Like how do a group of people come together on an organic level and cultivate collective choice, you know, the, the, an organic process of arriving at a choice that everybody present aligns with. Right. And that's an organic emergent exercise growing out of rather than a governance structure, an imposition of a, a hardened thing. Um, there's another woman who has something called chirotic flow, Kylie. And chirotic flow is uh, orientation of right time for what in the process of humans co-creating together. And that there is a natural order and sequence that's constantly involved. And if all of the steps, all of the ingredients of that cycle are not present all the time, it's gonna go out of balance off the rails and go wrong. It's a meta-dimensional orientation to it. I and mine are focused on the elements, ancient wisdom tradition out of Tibet, yogic tradition, um, not the four version, the five version, meaning um, earth, water, uh, fire, air, and space. And each one has its own properties you know, dimensional properties in the nature of the energy it contributes to the balance between the five dimensions. And in the face of an imbalance, how, how do you read that? And how do you determine what element is missing or underrepresented that could restore balance in informing the nature of the response to it? All of these things are focused on how we do us as living beings. And a piece of the puzzle that's really been living loud and large, and if I'm going too long, Jerry, cut me off. A piece that's been living loud and large for me recently is um, in in the natural orientation of living beings, we're all ultimately connected to everything around us. You know, that whole thing of everything's connected to everything. Well, in fact, everything's connected to everything. <laughs> like that's true. And everything each one of us does affects the whole. And if I am oriented to me, it's about me narcissistically and self-interestedly, um, then in that I am fundamentally adverse to the interests and the, the well-being and welfare of the whole. What makes me more interested in the whole than in my self-interest has to do with purpose. Not interest, personal interest, but a purpose that is transcendent of me as a as a as a force of one and higher level purpose ultimately speaks mark mark i don't know whether mark is still here but that that idea of user buy-in you know stakeholder buy-in you know what makes people come together cohere and align in service to a shared mission and that's not just an intellectual idea thing or a decision choice governance thing. That's an emotional thing. That's a, what is the power and, and energy and driver for me getting up in the morning and putting my shoulder to the wheel to try to save the world in my own little way. 
And that's a higher purpose kind of thing. There's a la last example is Bill Smith, William Smith has an AIC framework. He came out of the World Bank. AIC stands for Appreciation, Influence and Control. Again, a meta inquiry into in, within a system, what's going on. And, and his statement is, if, you're th if the thinking is not five dimensional, you're not even in the game. And all of this system stuff, frankly, is two dimensional in a five dimensional world. And with that, I'm complete. Sorry for the length of that. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Today, today, a lot of us have thought a lot and are busy like telling us what they thought, and it's great. I, I love the mix. Uh, two quick things before I go to Stacey. One is the notion of buy-in always irritates me because it means you're being sold something. It's buy-in. You're being sold something that somebody else designed, and they want to convince you to be all in on it and back it and whatever. And sometimes that's all you got. But much better is co-development, co-design, much better is participation when the thing got created, uh, in which case you're part of the product and you don't need to buy in. You, your authorship, uh, your participation was part of it. Uh, second thing I wanted to say was I just wanted to welcome Alistair, uh, who is with us for the first time, I think, from Malta, uh, having run into Ken Homer. And Alistair, thanks for joining us and uh, jumping into this conversation. I really appreciate it. Uh, you might... <laughs> You might be at dinner or something like that now, I don't know, but uh, um, love that you're love that you're here. And with that, let's go to Stacy. Thank you. Um, yeah, I also wanted to point out that every organization, every group of people has their own culture. And what I think that Sam, is Sam still here? What, what I suspect Sam's process will lead to is an amplification of those more po positive traits within a culture, such as connection, interdependence, engagement, and a sense of belonging. Implicit in that process is actually listening and hearing, even though it, we're not verbally doing it, that's what's actually happening. And so, you know, Doug, to your point, you mentioned, you know, Kylie and Winfinity and yourself. I'm connected to all those things. That's part of the cultural piece of me that I bring and connect to other similar people. I would say that we, and when I say we, I'm talking about those of us that attend many of these kinds of calls, have been doing these experiments where we have been gravitating to different places and different conversations, where the best ideas have been making it a little bit to the top. And I think we're navigating the piece right now, which has to do with how do we not let power and those other things take over. And Sam, I would delegate you to be my representative in tech matters. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Um, Alistair, I don't know, did you, did you hear when I uh, welcomed you to the call a little moment ago? You might've stepped away. Uh, yes, I was, uh, still, I was always from the phone. Uh, so I, I was just like, thank you for joining us. I mentioned that I think you bumped into Ken Homer, who said you might like these conversations. Yes, yes. yes. And you're actually in Malta, correct? Yes, yes, that's right. And Love that. In <laughs> That's great. And Hank, who has left us for a dinner in a theater, uh, Hank is in uh, the Netherlands, I guess, in Amsterdam, I think. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So we have a couple of, of European people. Sam is actually in Amsterdam, uh, living on a houseboat as we speak. Oh, so, nice. yeah. So yeah. actually, European turnout today was really strong. Mm -hmm. um, Gil, off to you in the booth, uh, out in the wild. Got a pass, can't be now. Okay. Uh, Jose. So this has been a, a really fruitful uh, conversation and it's, and it's kind of peaked a whole bunch of things in me, many of which have been mentioned, but um, just throw a little bit of um, extra thought to that 
So just Jerry, you said uh, buy-in and, and disliking that. I, I, as strange as it may be, uh, I also think that alignment is very similar to buy-in. We kind of get everybody. It's it's not good to have people have their own views. We all have to get onto the same view. Um, and that, to me, kind of dilutes the reality of, of life, which is we all have different views because that's the benefit of, of <laughs> being unique and different and having uh, different uh, makeups. Um, and so it's about benefiting from the, that diversity, not by converging on something. Um, because I, I like to think that when we take a whole bunch of people who have slightly diverse views on things and we keep cutting away that diversity, the thing we get in the middle is so watered down that we don't actually have what we claim to be diversity in the room. Um, we're, we're actually, oh, look at that cutie. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Wei Wei? Ray Ray. Uh, Ray, Ray Ray Ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We call her Ray Ray. Yay. I, I got to put you guys off of, uh, I'm going to put you on the speakers instead of uh, my headphones so cool. she can hear you guys talk. That's great. Thanks. Indoctrinator early. OGM or. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Jose. Um, well, our average membership age just plummeted. <laughs> <laughs> just went straight down um the other point was i think you made it also jerry which was or, or someone else did um you know all of this is rational systems we're thinking about all of this from a rational perspective and um living systems aren't rational and we can build all kinds of good rational systems um the system we have now is rather rational if you think about it, right? It should work, right? Um, but I think we need to really think more about um, the, the society as a system, um, humanity as a system, life as a system. And th those things are um, dynamic. Yeah. Um, so when we try to work from a, a place of um, simply rational actors and rational behaviors, uh, then I think we're, we're, uh, going astray. And when we are talking about systems, we're talking about social systems more than living systems and social systems, social structures, societal structures are, we, we are trying to work within the current societal structure. So Sam, for example, said about the nurses. My partner is a nurse at Stanford. And it's very true that the nurses know a lot more than most of the rest of the organization do. Um, but I wouldn't want to put the decisions of a hospital in nurses' hands. Because they don't see the other side either. They may see the faces of the patient. They may know exactly what's going on in those hospital rooms. But they don't understand necessarily the dynamics of the whole system. And, and so those things have to be emergent, I believe, rather than um, that we think that one part of the system can regulate the other part of the system Hi. and vice versa. It's about local regulation and it's about self-regulation that's my thinking about how governance really should be thought of. It's self-regulation within whatever we touch, whatever we know, whatever we sense and are able to influence. Um, the act of telling someone else what we're going to do uh, because the majority thinks that that's what we should do um, feels to me like, again, doing the buy-in, doing the alignment. Uh, and we've cut off whatever um, whatever benefits the minority has to bring to the table. So that's that's it for me. Just trying to capture all of the stuff that mm. uh, that was said was good.
Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, Gil, you said in the chat that you can't participate anymore, uh, but your hand is up. If you'd like to jump in, jump in. Otherwise, I will take your hand down from over, from the control booth in the sky. Uh, and we'll move to, oh, there we go. Thanks. Cool. Uh, Mr. Carranza, please. Ray, did Ray Ray draw something for us? Sweet. It's a systems diagram, like Stafford Beer would draw in his books. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Ray Ray. Oh, let's get Aiden. Come on. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Come here, young man. Sit together. Yeah. Let's sit ah, he overthrew Sam. Oh no! Wait. Nick, there's <laughs> more. There's more. He's got the rest of the posse. Who are we looking at, Sam? Oh my! My I'm not muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> We've been totally enjoying the the. Oh, I didn't realize. <laughs> oh, glad you enjoyed it. Um, so uh, this is Aiden here. He's Hi, six months Hi, old. Aiden. And this is Valkyrie, known as Ray Ray. Mm -hmm. And she is one and a half, or two and a half, two and a half. Two and a half. Well, that was. Hey, Ray Ray. It's awesome. Thank you. So I had uh, just a bounty of clients um, when I was a consultant, um, software consultant, business consultant. And um, one of them was Robert Rayo, uh, Corporate Motors, um, one of the largest um, uh, used car sales um, in Northern California, if not California, based in Hayward. Um, a very conservative man who's run for um, Congress um, in uh, 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 Contra Costa County. I don't think he got in. Um, maybe that's a good thing. He had a favorite saying, nothing happens without a sale. You are convincing someone of something and that's salesmanship now i'm challenged by that observation um and my dad um you know he was into dale carnegie and motivation and this and that and the other and, and sales 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 um ah! um you know, somebody who is really into mental dynamics and uh, what is it? Uh, science of mind. And, you know, your mind creates reality. And it's like, oh, God, <laughs> you know, where, where are you? <laughs> but, you know, that's a perspective. Um, I would love to highlight two things. One is what I said before. Chaos theory and nursing goes back to 1999 before. Um, there's a lot of chaos theory and nursing um, literature um, nursing was early on to chaos theory and complex dynamical theory. Um, there's a lot out there. Um, I would also like to highlight um, what I posted is the Wikipedia page on consensus decision making, um, blocking, Quaker-based models, um, other other models, tools and methods, groupthink. Um, uh, let's see, similar practices at the bottom. The Iroquois Confederacy Grand Council, 75% supermajority of final decisions, as there is 1142, the Zulu and Zosa, South African process of Indabada, community leaders gather, listen to the public, and negotiate figurative thresholds towards an acceptable compromise used during the 2015 United Nations Com Com Climate Change Conference. The SA and Nios Indonesian cultures from playground fights to state inheritance handled through a Musa Yarawaya consensus building process in which parties mediate to find peace and avoid future hostility and revenge. This is a huge, beautiful um, Wikipedia article. And again, consensus process is there already in many, many places. And tools to help consensus process, woo! -hoo! Yeah, let's do that. But we do not, as a culture, and as a, what, 11-person group here, talk enough about consensus decision-making that's already existent since 1142 and before. Um, the Catholic Church, huh, they go back a long ways. Judaism, um, India, and China, and how they govern things. You know, there's so many different models that have been successful and unsuccessful 
depending on context and constraints, uh, depending on the environment. Hey, um, what happens in the Nile River and the Yellow River when the rains come and we wash away all the you know, topsoil? Um, you know, okay, we build the Aswan Dam, we build the, uh, what is the Chinese huge dam? I forget, but you know, what happens when that? Three, gor three Gorges. Three Gorges Dam. Um, what happens when somebody bombs that dam? Um, um, my epistemology is based on three words. I don't know. And, but I, I certainly do know that the consensus process exists and we don't follow it. Now, liquid democracy may have some aspects of consensus process. And I'd love to compare and contrast, but hey, there's a lot of thinking out there that's been done for millennia that I'm not hearing in this conversation. And, Mark, I was, I was sharing my brain while you were talking because I've got a lot of those links that you were talking about all nested together under sort of group dynamics, dysfunctional group dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. They're all collected up there in one sure. of many ways in which we can represent this, but uh, yeah. I'm done with those three with three those three highlights: um, the nursing, the sales, and the consensus process Wikipedia page. Thank you. Well, thanks. And we are at the end of our time, but let's go hear from Sam and Stacy, and then we can wrap up this call. Sam is printing what the children just wrote. They have generated an essay in the time we've been talking. Is that right? <laughs> He's been taking notes. I saw him like work in the typewriter, like like work in the yeah. keyboard. Um, I just want to uh, just address Mark's, yeah, discussion. Yeah, make it, dude. Um, we're, I'm actually, I was, I, pro I proposed this to you. Sorry, hold on, Ray, Ray, I'm almost done. I proposed this to the group, and I'm, I'm going to sort of move forward with it, um, and you know, we'll see what happens. But it's the, it's basically the twelve principles or the principles of governance, good governance, and <clears throat> looking at all these historical processes, a historical. Um, government governance um, management, including tribal, you know, and um, councils and uh, all the, you know, council of women, council of elders, all this type of things. Looking at all of those and seeing kind of how they, um, how, whether they, fo how they follow and don't follow the principles, and sort of the result of of that, and um, <clears throat> and maybe the principles will t will change as we go through this process of examining the historical antecedents of, of our systems. But um, so um, that I think that's great. I really, really um, am looking forward to that process. And um, yeah, and and like, but, you know, we have to start somewhere. You know, I'm a holistic physician. I'm also I have a master's degree in acupuncture and oriental medicine. And I understand, you know, that there are other systems out there and there's other ways of seeing things. Um, and, um, and sometimes you got to work in parallel. Like you can't just say, well, Forget that. Forget that um, rational stuff, because you know what? There's a spiritual world, too, isn't there? Well, you know, yeah, but, you know, we got to we got to eat, you know, we got to make decisions here. Um, and so and so, yeah, of course, don't forget the spiritual, the the physical, the emotional, that stuff. You know, those all have to reside um, and they're all um, um, holographic. Right. They're all sort of representative of each other. You know, you got someone who has a anxiety. Well, OK. Talk to them about their spirit and their their emotions and their health, and but also maybe you know maybe they're not managing their blood sugar properly. Maybe they're like these are all parallel things, and you, and I, you know I'd just be wary of discouraging people from pursuing something that's rational because hey, there's other things, and you're not talking about things. Well, maybe I am, and maybe I'm not, but um, you know, but it, it's 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 got to start somewhere. Got to start somewhere. That's all I got. Thanks, Sam. That's Stacy. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to give an example of what I'm going to call a tale of two cultures exemplified by two men. Recently, there was a debate with Colin Allred and Ted Cruz. Colin Allred introduces himself being born, um, being raised by a single mother, having relatives in law enforcement, and how he's the most bipartisan member of Congress. Ted Cruz introduces himself as being born, his father was an immigrant, no mention of his mother whatsoever. Um, 
and how hard he had to work. And every time he votes in a bipartisan way, it's with the extremes. So I just wanted to remind people that Ted Cruz is the man whose wife was brutally, viciously insulted by Trump, whose ass he now kisses, that he's the one that never even mentioned his mother having any part in his upbringing, how he's the one that took off when his state was in a, a state of devastation and went to Cancun. And he's the one that we're supposed to trust to protect women. On the other hand, we have someone like Colin Allred, who is giving the credit to his single mother, who is speaking about his understanding of different perspectives, including his relatives in law enforcement, and who is the most bipartisan member of Congress. That being said, these are two different ways of seeing the world that's going to affect their behavior. And the people that they're surrounded by are gonna have some kind of connection to those things. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people within both groups that can resonate on similar things. And again, I think that the process Sam's talking about is a process that can draw that out or develop it. And just one other very quick thing, I've been in Facebook groups that have thousands of people. Those groups develop a culture. I've had my own groups that develop a culture. In my group, you don't see people attacking each other and it's not because I say you can't. It's because early on I modeled that and maybe once in a while I would say something and the group took over and maintained that culture. There have been other groups where everything was fine and then one bad actor, when Mark talks about people that don't have a lot of power but actually can change things, those powerless people are the ones that often abuse authority. So that's something to look out for too. So I'll stop here, but I just wanted to emphasize that who, the individual piece of it, because the individual piece of it expands into the group. And so sometimes I think it's important to start with the small. One last example that just came to mind. In a family, you have the designated leaders. The difference is in a family, you know that those leaders are interconnected to the other members of their family, and they're going to automatically be thinking about the best, you know, the best well-being of the whole. They're going to be thinking about the well-being of their property. And as it extends outward, maybe they'll be thinking about their immediate neighbors. You don't always have that in an organization where there's that kind of care and concern, not just for other members, but for people outside of the group. So that's also something to keep in mind. Thanks. I love this conversation. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, and we're, we've lost a, a few people to other to real life and other things. Um, I, we might have exhausted this topic, but I don't know. It feels really nice, but I'm, I would love to figure out how to frame it for another call. If we want to do this, uh, next Thursday, because we're on, remember, we're in an experiment now where we do check-ins only once a month on the first Thursday of each month. And then um, Ken Homer being absent, I miss him a lot and I miss his poems a lot. Uh, but I've got a poem to read to us by way of closing this call. Uh, but first I will call on Gil, who just raised his hand remotely, reporting in from Sustainable Brands. Yeah, San Diego, Jerry, you had suggested last week that I do something to steer the conversation next week. Do you still want to do that? And can you remind us what that was? Uh, good question. And I don't remember what that was, but I would, okay. let, let's talk about it between. Very good. I'm open. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Gil. Um, awesome. So the, the poem I will read to take us out is called Once the World Was Perfect by Joy Harjo and goes as follows. Once the world was perfect and we were happy in that world. Then we took it for granted. Discontent began a small rumble in the earthly mind. Then doubt pushed through with its spiked head. And once doubt ruptured the web, all manner of demon thoughts jumped through. We destroyed the world we had been given. 
for inspiration, for life, each stone of jealousy, each stone of fear, greed, envy, and hatred put out the light. No one was without a stone in his or her hand. There we were, right back where we had started. We were bumping into each other in the dark, and now we had no place to live since we didn't know how to live with each other. Then one of the stumbling ones took pity on another and shared a blanket. A spark of kindness made a light. The light made an opening in the darkness. Everyone worked together to make a ladder. A wind clan person climbed out first into the next world, and then other clans, the children of those clans, their children, and their children, all the way through time to now, into this morning light to you. Beautiful. Thank you all for being here. Um, love this group. See you uh, on the inner tubes and in a week. Bye.